So what are you drinking nowadays? Is that, are you still on that box wine stuff? I've been drinking the Brewdog um, seasonal. That's a beaut wow. toffee ale or toffee stout. Wow, that sounds awesome. Gosh. Perfect level of sweet. I'm not going to lie, dude. For like the last, I don't know, the, I, I would say probably the last mm-hmm. six months every week when I sit down and have a drink with you and all the other econoholics, I, it's, it's always been some sort of Irish whiskey. It's always been Tully Dew, Bushmills. Powers, Teelings, I, I don't know, like name an Irish whiskey, it's, I probably yeah, drank it. I, I, I've, I, I've <laughs> done a lot of Tully and Jameson on the podcast. I, 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 dude, I, I can't really have enough like of that. Silky. I really oh, like dude, Silky. I still haven't had Silky yet, dude. I need to find a bottle. I, I, okay, that's my mission yeah. now. Did you know that over $5 trillion exchanges hands on a daily basis? That's an average of over $220 billion an hour. Now, how does this much money move every single day, and why does it move the way it does? Here on Drunkenomics, two bartenders who also happen to be students at the University of Nebraska Graduate School of Business are going to sit down and drink to the global economy and try and translate it into English. So sit back, relax, pour yourself a stiff one, and have a drink with us to the comedy that is the global economy. All right, and welcome back to Drunkenomics, the drinking podcast with an economics problem. I am gonna check the VIX really fast to see dude, who's I, who today. Don't even check it, it man. Sus- you got it, dude. It was suspiciously I mean, low on. the other day. It's still suspiciously low. It, you're right. I think. Oh no, it was at like 18 the other day when I looked. What? On Friday. It was? I don't remember seeing it at like 18. 18 and but... a half. I was, I was absolutely bricking it. Like, wow. wait a minute. No, no, no. Dang. So this I was. Make any I missed sense. it by that much then, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, but that makes me your more gracious host, James Goldwater. Yes. Um, Join alongside. Alongside me. Both in time zone and in. <laughs> Over, and, over the Discord, drinks, yeah, is my less gracious co. That makes me co-host. Aaron Wong, yeah, and I'm so so glad to be less gracious for the I don't know, let's just call it 40th time this year. I was gonna say, many yeah, times we've, it's we've, been. we've done at least 46 episodes. Yeah, I think. so <laughs> we're right up there. Yeah, this year at least. But yeah, speaking of which, uh, if you like our content, we like you too. And if you want to find more content, you can also check us out on the Metaverse at uh, Drunken Uncle, D-R-U-N-K-E-N-O-M-I-C-A-L. That's us on Facebook and Instagram. So and also, that's us on Twitter, while supplies last. While, um, yep, while supplies last. Which, uh, yeah, oh, that was my fun one. I guess you were asking if I had any like weird news that I'd seen. Apparently, this is, I, I forget where I saw this, but it was someone who left Twitter is like, oh yeah, just based on the amount of withdrawal, like pull yeah. out of, of a firm's withdrawing their advertising, their advertising revenue is down 80% this month. Well, I mean, I wouldn't put it past Elon to be like, all right, well, I'm going to pay Twitter through SpaceX to run a bunch of SpaceX ads. And that's oh, yeah. how Twitter will have a revenue stream. And I, honestly, like, would, you, would that surprise you? It wouldn't because it's closely held by him. So it's not like it's an issue. Yeah. The problem will be is if suddenly Tesla starts to spend money or other things like that. Because I know that was a big concern of yeah. a lot of automotive advertisers was, well, if we advertise our autos on Twitter, is Tesla going to be able to see that? And will they behave in such a way as to yeah. protect Tesla? So I did see, because it's yeah. the same because there's a guy who holds. And so that's a very interesting position. So I've seen that like the the um, college football playoffs, yeah. um, the college championship game, and the Super Bowl. You're seeing a lot of the contracts being written essentially or allowing the uh, advertisers to withdraw their ads for whatever reason they yeah. want. Well, I mean, think about it though. So it's a pretty crazy thing. It's like like when was the last time you saw a Tesla ad when you're watching you know. Sunday night football. Like, I haven't, no. I haven't I, seen Tesla. And I'd be ever. honest, it'd be, it would be irresponsible advertising on Tesla's part. The only people <laughs> yeah. that are interested in Tesla either already have one or are playing in the game. So it's not, <laughs> yeah. it's not well, but like, really It's weird gonna, though too, because like I have seen GM and Ford ads on Twitter, but now that they're pulling all their content down, all their ad content down, yeah, you know, we'll see. I think there's like I think GM's going to be like, look, if I do advertise on Twitter, Twitter might do something to restrict those advertisements so that they don't get seen by as many people or get seen by the correct people, or that, that te- or that right. Tesla will be allowed to have an ad that marks my ad yeah, at a better price. Ex- exactly, and these are valid so, concerns. At the same time, this is happening. I also saw that Tesla's market share is down about 18% from where it was two years ago in the electric vehicle market in the United States. Yeah, but I, I, so I, I think not, everybody saw that coming, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm not trying to downplay, well, course, that. I'm not when, trying to downplay that point. No, but it's, no, no. You know. We all saw it coming because we've got, you know, Ford has 65% of its dealers agreeing to carry electric vehicles. Yeah. As these other guys enter the space, they're 
entering with less expensive electric vehicles. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, Tesla's and like, I, got I, real competition. Yeah, now. and I don't, like, I still think Tesla is going to, you know, I think they're going to do all right in the EV space, let's be honest, right? I think they're going to, they're still going to maintain a lot sure. of the market share, but it's always, it's the same old adage as, you know, the first one through the wall gets bloodied, right? So, Spotify, think about how many competitors Spotify has now, but 10 years ago, they didn't have all those competitors. No. And same with Netflix. You got to make a lot of money up right? front because later, when it gets more competitive, your profit margins are going to drop. So, yeah. you need to but like, be ready for your share price to reflect yeah, exactly. And think about who they're competing against, right? So Nef- Netflix, you know, at first they were, you know, super like if you look at their like how expensive the company was from a training perspective, like PE ratios and mm-hmm. you know, whatever accounting ratio you want to look at, they were extremely expensive. And then all of a sudden Disney enters the chat. CBS, Disney, Paramount, Paramount Plus, enters the Hulu. chat. Hulu, like all um, these companies with that have been around for a long time that have backing Amazon. Amazon, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, maybe not Amazon, but I'm saying like, yeah, like NBC. NBC has been around forever, right? And then they come out with with a streaming mm-hmm. service. And this is NBC. Even when Netflix was making its surge, was a very strong balance sheet company. If you look at their trading multiples, everything looks solid. Oh yeah, right. But they were also in that. Oh God, I can't believe I'm blanking on this. But what's that phase that you enter in when you're just like kind of coasting and growing by four percent a year oh What's that phase it's plateauing i know i know but um, this is an actual phase for it like in like the capital asset pricing model thing like there's an actual yeah i forget what it's, it's a bit yeah the business life cycle yes and exactly it's, it's a business um, life cycle and i forget what it is it's, it's like the growth phase and then there's like the uh, that phase maturity no it's like terminal but shakeout no it's like terminal shakeout no it's because you have I, you have launch growth shakeout maturity decline uh i don't know if that's the one but i i, I mean I mean, it's just think of like companies that have lasted forever, like Bank of America, they're in that phase and CBS and NBC, they're in that phase. And then all of a sudden they enter into this new space, this new marketplace the market that Netflix has provided. And same with like Spotify, right? You have Apple Music, Amazon. And I think that's, that's, that's kind of like the same deal with Tesla. Like they, they, they create like this electric vehicle and all of a sudden all these other car companies with strong balance sheets like Ford, yeah, GM. We're, we're literally like shake out, or we're talking about maturity. That's just the maturity phase. Oh, really? I f- we're still growing, but we're not growing as much. It's, it's, so, it's before a decline. Because you, you have that early, then you have I could have sworn it was called something maturity. else, but I, I don't know. I, I, it's been yeah. a long time since I've been in grad school, but I'm an old man. But, yeah, but you know, but, like, but the, either way, the point is GM and for the companies that have super strong balance sheets otherwise why would you buy their stock right because they're they've been around forever there's no there's not that much growth to be had for Ford and GM yeah you're buying confirmed um cash flows you're buying yeah, but then, strong yeah but then like infrastructure kind of like Spotify and Netflix Tesla comes in they provide this new marketplace and then next thing you know like it, it gives Ford and GM another growth opportunity and you know it like it makes it tough for Tesla to compete because Tesla doesn't have the balance sheet that Ford and GM have. They don't have the cash flows that Ford and GM have. And they don't, and they don't have the proven but, track record of manufacturing. It, yeah, exactly. So they're, you know, not, not to say that they have a bad track record, but it's like they don't have, you know, 80 years or 100 years that Ford has, right? They don't, they they don't, don't have, have that streamlined manufacturing experience. They don't have yeah. proven plants and distribution and dealerships. Exactly. They don't have all, so, you know, that's, that, that's what I mean. So Twitter, while supplies last, that's, that's essentially, I don't know, like maybe Twitter finds new, av- yeah, <laughs> it's just, it's at Drunkonomical. Maybe Jack, maybe you know, we're, we'll do our best to be Drunkonomical on Jack Dorsey's new social media too. Yeah, whenever that, um, one, yeah, whenever that one comes out. <laughs> whenever that comes yeah, out. Hopefully we get, that, hopefully um, we get sponsored by Totally New by that point. <laughs> Or Metallica's whiskey, yeah, that'd be cool, open. yeah. Or both, but, I'm willing to. Both. I'm willing I'll take to, a both, yeah, I mean, I'll drink Tulio yeah. on Mondays and I'll drink Blackened on Tuesdays, I'll, I'll like them both. Absolutely. Sure. But yeah, no, other than that, it's been, I, I, it's, I mean, wow, I mean, I, Friday. I know, do, well, do we talk about right? the Federal Reserve over and over again? Because I feel like, I mean, I, don't, I hate to just beat the dead horse, but. All right, I mean, we're going to hit it two or three times and then <laughs> just, it's, it's done, a it's couple, dead. A couple, <laughs> yeah, um, okay, there we go. Uh, here, here's what I'll say, I just, it's just a, we had an amazing, like an amazing jobs report on Friday, absolutely blowing away his, whatever the, you know, the yeah. expectations were for, for the jobs, especially in the wages. So yeah. with that in mind, uh, any idea now of just basically, oh, look at all this information that says we need to, we need to cut the increase to 50 basis points. Absolutely not. You nope. to say it's 75, unless yep. basis points isn't actually going to solve the problem, in which case, then well, what we're doing in the first place. Yeah. So, but now there's no reason to cut. 
the increase. Yeah. The and, slowly and increase. There's no. Also, the people that were always like, okay, well, inflation has gone up because wages have gone up. That's that's just not true. I'll just go ahead and debunk that real quick. It's Wages have not gone up not, at the same pace that inflation has gone up. And if you think about inflation, like what has happened with inflation over the last year, like CPI came out, what was the last one, like 7.7 or something like that? Uh, like, yeah, I think so. Yeah. So it, it, it declined from whatever the month before it was, which was like 8.1 or something like that. I forget whatever, whatever it was, it declined. Mm-hmm. Right. But still... That's on a year to year basis. That's on a year over year basis, right? So 7.7 year over year, but month over month, it's still going up. So remember earlier in the year when the Fed said the number one goal for this year was to do what? I forget that. They kept, they kept saying it over and over I again. I say it was just to get inflation under control. Oh, that's what it is. Oh, yeah. I don't know why. Which my is hilarious <laughs> because last year, remember, they were trying to get inflation going. Yeah. Um, well, they were seriously convinced that it was transitory, which is, you know, that's th- that's still the biggest joke. And like, that's, I don't know. That's when you know that no way. one's let's serious is in charge. But. They don't know what's going on. Aaron and I could see that it wasn't transitory. We were drinking. Yeah. We knew like, it was like a lot. <laughs> wasn't right yeah like a lot. Um, I, we couldn't walk in a straight line but we still knew inflation wasn't transitory yeah, i can tell you that one nope. <laughs> yeah. and guess what it would have cost a lot less for me to tell you that so either way yes uh they were saying that they're trying to get inflation under control guess what it's not under control and guess what we still have a really strong not, so we still have a really strong labor market and you know and supply chains yes ha- have eased a little bit well demand we still... demand has collapsed if we're if we're going to look at if we're going to look at manufacturing out of china the manufacturing data exactly there's a demand collapse for their goods exactly i read they were that there was you know manufacturing demand was down 40 percent or something in um oh yeah it, God, down that's 40 percent down 21 percent month over month we know that apple is trying to move its manufacturing out of china it's just they don't want to be there anymore. They want to move to India, Vietnam. Yeah. So that's um, the thing is, so, so right now we're looking at all that manufacturing is down 40% in China, which China manufactures almost every, like think about everything that you own. There's like a made in China bumper sticker on it somewhere. Right. So if manufacturing is down 40%, that means there's less things. If there's less yeah, things, if there's less stuff. <laughs> what, what happens to the price? Just, just take a wild guess. Historically, when there's less, st- when there's less supply, price increases. Yes. Unless the re- unless demand unless, decrease exceeds supply decrease, yeah. But I mean, is that happening right now? So, well, for some yes. stuff, yes. Okay, yeah, some stuff. I, I, I admit it was like all held, all else held constant, right? So demand held constant. Yeah, supply to use, goes down. To use that one word that the economists keep using, set or the two words, ceteris paribus, right? All ceteris other paribus. things being yes, kept exactly. Equal. Right, nice, I like that. Exactly, ceteris paribus. All things, all else held constant. Supply goes down. Price goes up. Demand. Conveniently, at at this time, at this juncture in our economic cycle, has also gone down. So prices, ha- which isn't a great news going into December. No, it, um, it really isn't. So there's that, and then of course with Apple moving out of China, I feel like that's gonna there's gonna be like a pause in supply increase, right? Yeah. So well, let's put it this way: this this decrease in manufacturing in China is so substantial that. So Chinese factories historically have always closed right around Lunar New Year for a week. Oh, yeah. Lunar New Year this year is on January 21st, or next year is on January 21st. Yeah, it's always different. Um, it's always around that time frame, though, but yeah. Yeah. So from the 21st to the 28th, factories were going to be closed because that's seven days after Lunar New Year is a national holiday in China. Right now, it looks like factories are going to be shutting down two weeks prior to Lunar New Year because there's just no demand for goods, so they just don't need to be open. Oh, and so when oh. you've got factories that will be closed for three weeks yeah. <laughs> out of a month. So 21 days is pretty much a pause on production, which means current inventories. What happens to that, right? I mean, not that there's going to be an auction for current inventories, but just think of it like that if it provides better illustration. But all that's happening. I hate to say this because like, remember last week when we were talking about uh, the, all the protests that's going on in China, mm-hmm. right? So I, I think the biggest issue in China that China is facing is that humanitarian issue without a doubt, right? Like I think China, if they were to do yeah. the right thing, they would just say, here is your God given freedoms back. But in China, it would be translated more like, here is your president Xi given freedoms back to you, right? Like that's, that's how they were. That's how they were translated. Look at these. But, look at these new freedoms President Xi is offering. Yeah, exactly. That's, um, but that's I, yeah. I think they should do that. I, and granted, if they were to do that, like think about what would happen to demand, right? Like demand would shoot up. Which, well, at least internally. Yeah. Um, it, the inter- real problem is, is you're start, as as you start to see this flight of um, firms out of China. I think what you're starting to see is China's inability to escape the middle income trap. Exactly. Which, yeah. Essentially means that China's been able to 
drive all of its economic growth on being the cheapest labor or some of the cheapest labor in the world, but that's not sustainable anymore. They, yeah. they, they, they aren't the cheapest labor anymore yeah, they exactly. aren't by a long shot. And it's now no longer in the interests of the businesses that are manufacturing there to continue to manufacture there. So they're moving in Apple's case to India and Vietnam yeah. um, and other countries. It's Indonesia, well, Malaysia. Yeah, yeah I was going to say uh, Malaysia. And at the same time, it's happening. China now needs to find a new market for its exports. The problem is it doesn't have any. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, that are legitimately and, its. Yeah. And just, just a, you know, because I feel like I kind of left a, left a cliffhanger on what I was saying previously. Like, I mean, oh, if, sorry. You know, no, no worries. Like it's because it's, it's kind of a morbid subject, but like, honestly, like China opening up the humanitarian issue, like if they, if that just got resolved, like that's a price I'm willing to pay economically. Just, just me personally, just because the humanitarian thing is awful. Yeah. But the demand surge, honestly, like I feel like it would also provoke certain things, other things to happen, like OPEC plus uh, lifting uh, the daily production. You know, uh, the petroleum. Daily yeah, I, I think I, you'd see an increased demand for fuel or for oil, so you'd see them raising production by a course. certain amount. Another one yeah. is I, I thought I thought maybe it was my tin foil hat a few weeks ago when I said that <laughs> Iran. It looks like there's going to be substantive change there, um, and that's why you're seeing some of these OPEC countries cut back on production. Oh yeah, based on the news I'm reading out of there. That's it. my tinfoil hat's looking a little bit less tinfoil, a little bit more regular hat. Apparently, really? the moral police, the morality police have been disbanded How? in Iran. Uh, the government's decided they're no longer necessary. The law that the young woman was picked up by the morality piece oh, for wait, viol- sorry. I was thinking violating. Other, yeah, I was thinking the other way around. And okay, killed, yeah. No, that's great. And then no. killed while in their custody. The law which she was believed to have been violating, right? She didn't get a day in court, so we can't say she did. Yeah. They're now looking at that law and they're going, Actually, this whole law seems kind of silly. So maybe it will be removed as well. So this, so this is a good so, thing, right? This is a good. Sounds like it's a good thing. It is for it is for personal freedoms. Excellent. Uh, there are also, and so I, like I said, I, I collate news from a lot of places, not just economic sources, but also political sources. Some of these th- think tanks that I read believe that there's now actually an endemic. Um, that there is now an a very very low level but insurrection throughout Iran. So there is now actually. In parts of Iran, the government is not in control as oh. well as they'd like to be. So okay. I, I so, think looking at a lot of this, the the religious, the the, the theocratic yeah. part of the regime is looking very desperate to maintain power. Okay, well, so I mean, honestly, that's perhaps good to- a more democratic Iran is not so far off. Okay, cool. Well, that's actually a good thing. I mean, who, who knows? Like, yes, because then it, you can trade the re- with them. Yeah, and the review hasn't been finished yet, but I mean, let's hope that they come out on the other side with a better ruling, with a more favorable ruling by the people, because, you know, it'd be nice if everybody stopped protesting. And I think the way that for that to happen is for them to get what they want, which I'm not totally against. I, I you know, it's not like they all want free hot dogs, right? You know, they, they just want to be able to wear whatever they want. And that's, that's totally okay with me. Absolutely. So, so, I mean, that's pretty cool, man. Uh, I guess aside from that, like the only other thing that I saw was just the, the Fed presser at the Brookings Institution. Mm-hmm. They were Institute. flirting. It's not the Institute, it's the Brookings Institute. Why did I say institution? Because I wrote it down on notes. Because okay, that's, I, cause, yeah, cause it, cause, it makes... because that's what happens when you make notes, when you type out notes, when you're half a bottle of I I've told you, look at this bottle. It's, it's like, oh, I guess it's a little bit more than half a bottle, but check that out, man. It's like a little bit more than a quarter a bottle, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I did do a little bit of damage oh, on it left. yesterday. I'm sorry versus, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I guess like, so, I mean, I did do a little bit of damage on this bottle last night, but not that much. So, you know, when you type no. notes, when you're about, you know, I'll say a third of a bottle in. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I, yeah. There are times yeah. where I'll just get working and like, I'll be, I'll be drinking and I'll be working. And the next thing I know, four hours has gone by. Four hours, a third of a bottle, and 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 like the notes still make sense, but the spelling errors just yeah. Ticks Brookings up. Institution um, versus okay, Brookings Institutes. The Fed made the Fed presser at the Brookings Institute. Jerome Powell spoke there, and if you actually watch the speech, there's a lot of him contradicting himself, right? <laughs> so like, if we needed more mixed signals, there it is. There's go to the Fed if you want mixed signals. You don't need to find like a girl on Tinder if you want mixed signals, or a guy on Tinder if you want mixed signals. No, you can just, just turn Jerome Powell on and get him. <laughs> it's not even two preface conferences. <laughs> it's the same press conference. He'll, yeah, as a matter of fact, do dude, any um, Fed president, any any Fed governor, just watch one press conference. Is wow, mixed signals like crazy. But that brings us to actually a really cool, and it's a and it's kind of a it's it's us phasing into a question or a series of questions that we've received lately from more than one um, <laughs> listener. Aww. The actions of the Fed are generally are meant to drive down economic growth and may even, based on well, let's put it this way. Depending on who you ask, there's somewhere between a 100 and 
what, 90% chance, but I've a few, uh, JP Morgan said a hundred percent chance of recession in 2023. So did Bloomberg. Yeah. And Bloomberg has said the same thing. Yeah. And so, um, the real big question, and this is not financial advice, but the real big question everyone asks is how do you avoid the downside? How do I do that? Or how do you make money on the downside? Or more importantly, yeah. How do how I do make money? How, how do you eat everyone else's lunch when they're all yeah. freaking out. And there's a nice right? little, th- yeah, there's a nice little thing called options, which I feel like I've mi- I told people that I was going to make a, a, like a full on actual presentation while drinking on options. And I guess this is it. Is this it? I think this is it. So let's, let's just, let's I know it. we've talked, we've historically talked about options very, very quickly, Yes, but let's, let's kind of go back to our roots and go into a deep dive on what options really are. Yes. And just by, um, just so you guys all know, like, I love talking about options. I'm an options geek. So if you guys have questions on options after this episode, feel free to ask them on it, like in our DMs on Instagram, ask them uh, in our Discord, whatever it is, feel free to ask away whatever questions you have on options. Be more than happy to answer them. But with that said, yes, let's uh, let's talk about what they are. What 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 is what is an option? All right. So so the um, the really cool thing is that it has a very very basic, easy peasy definition, right? So an option is just yes. a financial inst- uh, just a financial instrument that is based on the value of an underlying security, usually a stock, right? So it's it's, a, yes. it's something that derives its value from a different security. Yeah. So it's a derivative. It it's a type of derivative. The type of derivative, and basically, like, how does it derive its value? Why does it derive its value? It derives its value because when you buy an option, what is an option? It, like, why is it called an option to begin with? Because it gives you the option to buy or sell. Right. So yeah, it's, it's a it's a shortening yeah. of option to buy, option to sell. Yes. You have an option. It, yeah. So it gives you the right to buy or sell um, a certain stock at a certain price at a previously agreed upon price by a certain date. Right. And mm-hmm. think about why this exists. Right. So, you know, I, I used to use a real estate example. This is kind of like the old classic example that I brought up. Like, I think last time we talked about it, it was like almost two, like two years ago. But it's, you know, there's a million dollar strip mall that you're trying to buy, but you don't know if there's asbestos on it and you're waiting for the results to come in. But you don't know. And this owner of the strip mall wants to sell it to you. You don't want to pay a million bucks because if it comes in and the, and the, the asbestos results are positive, then you'd lose a million bucks, essentially. I mean, that, that land is or no you're, good. Or you're going to have to tear it down. So <clears throat> you lock in then a contract with it and it says, hey, I will buy this from you. Or, or essentially, yeah. I, will, I, will, I, will, yeah. I will buy from you the option to buy this at that price in 30 days. Exactly. And hopefully by 30 days, the results come in. Otherwise, you know, you got to buy another contract, right? But like you say, hey, like if, if you, James, you're the owner of the strip mall, I say, hey, James, I'll give you a thousand dollars for the right to buy this strip mall for a million bucks 30 days from now. And James goes, you know what? What do I have to lose? I, you know, the listing price is a million bucks, right? It's a thousand dollars in cash flow today. Why wouldn't I do it? So he goes, yeah, sounds good. And so now there's three results, right? There's the asbestos comes in negative. There's no asbestos in the land. And now the, the, the price of land appreciates a little bit. And James, poor James, still has to sell this plot of land to me for a million bucks because I have that. Well, only if it. you show up and exercise. Only if you exercise. Yeah, I know. But with, but with actual options. But like, you're it, gonna. It, with actual options, like if they're in the money, they're going to automatically exercise. So yes. Yeah, which we'll, which we'll talk about a little bit more. But yeah. So either that happens, either the land doesn't go appreciate in value at all and James just pockets a, a, you know, $1,000 or the land loses value. The asbestos, po- uh, the asbestos results come in positive. There is asbestos in the land. James loses value on the land, unfortunately, but at least he pocketed a thousand dollars, right? But I make a thousand dollars while I waited. Yeah. Um, so th- that was just like a, like a nice cover call example. So like to talk about options, let's talk about like the types of options. There's the right to buy and then there's the right to sell, right? So the right to buy is just, you know, a call option. So there's a stock that's trading at 50 bucks. I buy the right to buy the stock at 50 bucks from James for five dollars, right? So I give James five bucks. Now I have the right to buy this stock at 50 bucks on or before. Sometime, well, so then the other yeah. one is the right to sell at a yeah. predetermined price, right? That's a put. Mm-hmm. So the put yeah. option gives you the right to sell at a predetermined price between now and the future. Now there's, I, I guess there's, there's one thing we should get out of the way before yes. we go in on deeper dive. And it's okay, the yeah. difference between European and American options. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk, let's just get that out of the way real quick. What is the difference? Between because, the- because once this is done, 
assume that we're talking about American options. Yes. Because, just for, because it will make more sense. But the yes. difference is so an American option can be exercised at any time between the purchase and the expiration and date of the yes. option, right? So only only by the person that is only by the person that bought the option, right? The seller of the option yes. can't exercise it. But no, the, the but the, but the, the, the holder option. the holder of the option may yes. exercise at any time yes. when they acquire it to the to the death of the option. Um, yes. to, the, to the termination of the option. In a European contract, yeah. it may only be exercised at the uh, yes. at that end point. So if it's if it's seven days from now on an American option, you have all that time between now and seven days from now to exercise. If it's a European option, it really you're you're sitting there going, it's got to be on this date, seven days from now. That's where you where it's how you choose to exercise or not. Exactly. Um, but like the thing about European options, like you can still trade them, right? So like you can buy yes. an option and you can still sell it before expiration date. Which that's the yeah. thing about like a lot of option traders. I don't know of, of a lot of option traders that actually want to be exercised upon or actually want to exercise. But in most cases, like. If you buy a call option, if you buy the right to buy a stock and the stock goes up, you'll probably be able to sell depending on time decay and all that kind of stuff. But you'll probably yeah, be able you to- Yeah, you should be able to turn around and sell that because someone's going to be looking and go, oh, you bought the right to buy at $50 for $5. Well, I'll buy the right to buy at $50 for $9 from you. Because exactly. now spending $9 on you and then $50 on the stock, I'm spending 59 but it's trading at 60 So- Hey, I'm still coming out ahead. Exactly. So like, right? think about the real estate example, right? So I buy the right to buy James's strip mall for a million bucks, but I buy it for a thousand dollars. And now, you know, a couple of days later, you know, the strip mall is appraised at $1.1 million. What do you think happens to the price of my option? It's worth more than a thousand. It's certainly worth and a lot. And if you don't actually, and if you don't actually want to take possession of that real estate, of that property, you might turn around and go, Hey, who wants to buy this $1.1 million property for $1 million? I'll sell you the right to do that for 10 grand. Exactly. Well, yeah. At that point, it'd probably be worth at least 100 grand. But yes, exactly. That's essentially, yeah. Well, yeah. That's essentially but, what but, it then, is. but then that person might sit there and go, 100,000. Well, it's already going to cost me 1.1. 1. 1. I might as well just wait until the actual thing and then I'll buy it for 1.1. 1. 1. Exactly. Yeah. Depending on if they think, but it all depends on wh- whether or not they think that the th- underlying pot of land is going to go up. But, yeah, I mean, we might be going. We might be getting a little ahead of ourselves. I think the I think the next thing we Absolutely. really need to talk about is the type of positions you can have with an option. So I think when it comes to trading options, like the four things that you can do, like ultimately what it comes down to is a combination of buying a call, shorting a call, buying a put, and shorting a put. That's right. essentially the so, four types of opening trades you can have on an option. Exactly. And when we talk buying, it's you're going long on a put. It's we talk about this in in securities, or we've talked about this with stocks as well. Where you can go long, or you can go short, right? Yes. What do you exactly. want the value of that to do? If you're long, you want the value to go up. If you're short, you want the value to go down. Yes. It's kind of the easiest way to describe that. Yeah. So um, think of, so think about it like this: like if you if you go long a call, if you buy a call option, what do you want the underlying stock to do? You, you'd right? like the value to increase, so that then when you turn around to either sell the option or to exercise the option. You're getting it at a, you're buying at a discounted rate or you're selling for more money than you bought for. Exactly. And then if you short, well, yeah, well, yeah, Yeah. I I hear what you're saying. So like, if you think about it, yeah, yeah, if if you buy, if you buy a 50 strike call, you wouldn't exercise like a 50 strike call means you have the right to buy the stock for 50 bucks. Right. And it's, it's, you know, over a hundred shares, but either way, um, let's just talk about it in like one share increments just to simplify it. But we will. uh, Yeah. Yeah. So you buy. A 50 strike call, you have the right to buy a certain stock for 50 bucks. If the stock is trading at 45 bucks, would you exercise the right to buy it for 50 bucks? Probably not, right? Like, yeah, there, there, in- there, you, there are times where maybe you would be, but, it, but if we're ignoring very, very specific situations where you just need to have that share. Yeah, it's, I mean, no. honestly, like, like bar. Yeah, uh, well, honestly, because like, if if, yeah. if you really need the share, odds are you can still just go to the market and buy it for forty five bucks. And buy it for forty five. So, so sure, why would you, true. So why would you ever exercise it for fifty bucks? And that's the same with the put option, right? If you have the right to sell something for fifty bucks and the stock is at sixty bucks, why would you exercise the right to sell it for fifty bucks when you could sell it for more at sixty bucks? You sell for you can sell for ten dollars more at sixty bucks, right? You know that that's what is called in the money out of the money doesn't make sense for you to exercise right if it's in the money that means it makes sense for you to exercise that means it, that the barring right to buy anything stock. else it is in your interest to exercise the option yeah so for instance i have the right to buy a stock at 100 bucks the stock is trading at 101 
right? It would make sense for me to exercise my right to buy for a hundred instead of going to the market and just placing a market order for 101 bucks, right? And same with short with the other side, you know, if I could short a stock at a hundred bucks, like why would I go to the market and short for 95 bucks? Yeah, exactly. No, when you're in the money, it's, it's where you're sitting here going, it is in your, in, in your bar, I guess it barring any other this is the only thing you've got in the market, um, or this is the yeah. only reason you're making the decision. It is in your interest to make this to either exercise the option and acquire whatever it is, right? Just yeah. If that's what you're trying to do, or turn around and go to the market and sell your option to someone who intends to exercise because yeah. it's because the option is now valued at a greater rate exactly. than you used to than, than it was when you yeah, purchased and it. In the money and out of the money, like that has none of that has anything to do with the price of the trade, the cost of the trade. So if you bought a call for five bucks and it's only $3 in the money. So in other words, if you buy 100 strike call for $5, the break even is actually 105, right? Mm -hmm. But if the stock is at 103, you're still $3 in the money because like you're not breaking even, but at least you're not losing all of your money. Well, and you might be able to turn around and, and sell now for a, well, you're still probably not going to break even yeah, you're you're free, yeah, what yeah. you paid. Yeah, you're not even paid, but but it still makes sense to exercise because it's like you paid five bucks. Like the stock is at one hundred three. Why would you buy it at one hundred three when you had the right to buy it at one hundred at one hundred? Still, right? It still makes you know, sense for you to. Pay, and even if you paid five dollars a share to, to yeah. acquire that, right? So it still makes um, yeah. So it still makes sense to exercise. But I guess the other side of that would be like if you're short a call. Exactly. Right? So when we say um, short a call. We mean we're shorting the option itself. Not, not creating, not yeah. a short position on the on the, the security, right? So that's this is where this. Some of these are going to become a little confusing. We admit that, and yes. um, so when you want to, when you're shorting a securities a position on securities, you want the security price to go down. When you're shorting the option, you want the same thing. Exactly, the price of the option to go down. So think about it like this, right? Not necessarily the price of the security. In fact, you'll probably get the price of the option to go down by seeing a opposite effect with the with the puts with exactly. the secu- with the security you're looking yeah. at so essentially like exactly like what you said if you short a put option right so think about it this way like every single option there's a buyer and a seller so james wants to buy a put i want a shorter put like you don't need you don't need to have the option to short the to sell the option you can just short it you can just create one right and it's not very hard all you gotta do is just place an order right on your brokerage platform so if james wants to buy a put i want to sell a put I can sell James the right to sell a stock. So I would be short a put. James would be long a put. Me being short the put, I want the stock to stay above the strike price of the put. Because then I won't exercise. It'll stay out of the money. I won't exercise. I've bought something from Aaron that will never be used. And so Aaron takes the premium and he has a good day. He has a tully on me. I have a tully on James. But what if the opposite happens, right? So let's say I I, I... sell to James the right to sell a stock at 50 bucks. So And it starts James, trading at 30. Yeah. Oh god. Because wow. yeah, because, because news just broke that um everyone's that the, that fired this, and that um, the CEO wants to buy Twitter. Yeah. It um, turns out Trevor turns out Trevor Milton really didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> yeah, um, whatever it is. It, it turns out so Hertz, right? Hertz. Let's say I sh- let's say <laughs> so Hertz stock. Let's say I shorted a Hertz put, right? So I don't know what the stock is trading at, but let's say the stock is trading at 20 bucks and I sell you the right to sell uh Hertz at 15 bucks. So James is thinking like what, what James is hoping for is he's hoping that Hertz stock goes to zero because he bought the put. Yeah. So when you buy the put, you want the stock to go down because ultimately you want the stock to go to zero. And so he can short it at 15 bucks and turn around and buy it for zero and cover his short position. Right. So he makes, you know, exactly. a $15 Make per share profit. $15 per share profit. Yeah. And whereas Aaron wants it to stay above 15, he doesn't want me to, he doesn't want yeah. me to exercise. Exactly. If it does, however, drop below, it drops to zero. I'm going to exercise the right to sell. As you should. Well, I'm going to sell at zero, or I'm going to, I'm going to exercise the right to sell at 15, despite the fact the market says zero. Yeah. And then I'm going to go into the market, and I'm going to say, hey, look. I need to cover my shorts. I'll buy them back for a penny, because I have to offer you something. I can't just say, hey, I'll buy it back for zero. Yeah, but at that, at that point, if it's at zero, it just gets delisted, and you just have a short position that you achieved max profit on. Well, exactly. But, <laughs> but I mean, that's more or less the point. Like, let's just say it goes to a penny, right? You, you cover your shorts at a penny, so you make a $14.99 uh, per share profit. Whereas me, when you short a put 
and you get exercised upon. So like when you're short a put, you can't you can't exercise. You can't just be like James, James, you gotta sell me the stock at fifteen bucks a share. I can't do that. But when I'm short a put and James says, All right, I wanna exercise my right to sell the stock at fifteen bucks. Guess who has to buy the stock from James at fifteen bucks? I do. Yeah, you're left right? holding the bag. Exactly. Because you've agreed, so, you've essentially agreed to cover the opposite position. You're saying, I'll buy from you at this yeah. price. So, like, think of it this way, too. Like, so if, if whenever you short a put, you also have to think about it like you're willing to buy the stock if it falls to this price, but not quite like in the sense that like it's a limit buy order. But you have to think about it like you have to at least be willing to do that. At least that's my logic. Whenever you short a put option, is you have to be willing to own the stock at that price. Yeah. But regardless, I sell James the right to sell hertz at 15 bucks a share if it falls below 15 bucks no matter what it falls to the options clear uh so the occ options clearing corporation yeah the occ yeah Yeah. the occ yeah so they're gonna be like oh wait who was on the other side of this trade aaron was aaron guess what you have to fork over 1500 bucks to buy 100 shares of hertz from james at this price because he says that he wants to exercise his right to sell so So, yeah so that's how yeah. That respect. So long and short on an option, that's how that works, is that essentially when you short an option, you're selling someone, someone is buying from you the right to sell at a given price. That's for a put, which, yeah. Which is for put. And the contra of that is you're willing to buy from someone a certain thing at a certain price. Yeah, so- If they it, exercise. Yeah, so if I sell James a call option, right? So, you know, if I sell to James the right to buy a stock at 50 bucks, if the stock stays below 50 bucks, I'm fine because James, it makes no sense for James to exercise. Right. And Correct. I just take whatever premium I sold it for. So if I sold it to James for five bucks, the right to buy a stock for 50 bucks, then I just keep the five bucks and I, and I buy myself a totally do with it later on. But if the stock soars above 50 bucks, I'm short the call. James is long the call option. Now there's two ways you right? can cover it. Yes, there is. There are two ways you can cover it. But the main way really is like, let's just say I have no positions, right? Like it's, okay. let's just say it's Occidental stock and you buy a $50 call option on Occidental. And I short it mm-hmm. to you, right? I sell it to you and I'm naked. I don't, I don't own the stock. I don't, you know, I don't own any okay. other calls around it. So I sell you the right to buy Occidental at 50 bucks and Warren Buffett announces that he's buying X amount of shares of Occidental. Occidental shoots through the roof. Um, it goes to 70 bucks. Well, James can be like, hey, well, I paid five bucks. I have the right to buy this stock at 50 bucks at a 50. share. I got to buy it from somebody. So who's going to, you know... Somebody's got to honor this trade. Oh wait, who who bought this? Who sold me this? Uh, yeah, who's yeah, who sold me this contract? Exactly. And I'll be like, oh shoot, the OCC caught me. It was me. I was the one that sold James's contract. Since I don't already own the stock, I have to go to the market, buy a hundred shares of Occidental at seventy dollars a share because Warren Buffett boosted the price of the stock up to seventy bucks, and I have to turn around mm-hmm. to sell to James for fifty bucks. Right. So I lose big on that. I bought something for seventy, and turn around immediately and sold it for tw- for fifty. That's a twenty dollar loss, and James is sitting there with a with a twenty dollar profit minus whatever premium he paid for it. Exactly. So at so, this point, a fifteen dollar fifteen dollar profit on this trade alone between this and then. So yeah. So that's yeah. now. If you happen to own some of that already, you could just turn around and sell to me at cost. Exactly. Or, or at, so you could turn around and sell the shares you hold. Yeah. Exactly. So let that, that would be a covered call, right? So let's say I bought the stock at forty. I've been sitting on it for over a year, and the stock hasn't moved, and I'm just so tired of it not moving. So I keep selling call options against it. I sell a call option and a month later, the stock doesn't move. So that call option expires worthless because on expiration day- But not worthless to you because in- someone has probably purchased that option. Yeah, exactly. So, but like- think, and think, so, you, so you made something. Yeah. So like, think about like, I mean, every single option expires, right? So like, you know, every month, right? So the December options, I think, uh, whatever the third Friday is, which I think is the 16th mm-hmm. of this month, right? So the 16th, December, December 16th calls, right? If they're not in the money, they, they expire worthless. So if I sell you a $50 call and the stock stays below 50 bucks, or if it closes at 50, $50 or below, then it goes worthless. Now, if there's also after our pin risk, all that kind of stuff that I don't really want to get into, but let's just say it stays at 50 bucks and stays at 50 bucks throughout the entire post-market session on Friday, December 16th, which is the expiration date that I sold you for the 50 strike call. Mm-hmm. Like at that point, if it stays at 50 bucks, then it just goes worthless and I just keep whatever premium that, that you paid me. That I paid you, yeah. But if it goes above that, well, if I already own the stock, I just sell you the stock that I own. 
It's kind of like you sitting on that strip mall. You just sell me that strip mall that you already own. Whereas if we go the other right. way, I have to buy a strip mall and worth the same amount and then yeah. sell it to you at yeah, the other, price. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't own the strip mall, then it's like, oh shoot. Well, if now the strip mall is worth 2 million bucks and I have the right to buy it from you for a million bucks, you got to turn around and buy the strip mall for 2 million bucks, turn around and sell it to me for $1 million. Hopefully you had a good premium pay on that because if you didn't, then you're out a lot of money. Oh yeah. But, no, it is, a, it, yeah. can, it is an expensive, it, it's put this way. If you're on the wrong side, this is an expensive. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's a like options well, are a really complicated subject. I feel like a lot of people that chime in, cause I see a lot of people talk about their trades on the not financial advice discord channel. And I feel like a lot mm -hmm. of people know a lot about options. So next week we are for sure going to talk about more complicated trades. Like when there's a trade involving two options, right? So when you buy a call and sell a call above it, or when you sell a call and buy the call above it, right? What's your goal when, when you do that? Or what is an iron condor, right? What, a lot of people- Yeah, so we're definitely gonna talk about strategies. Um, yeah, which I would, like, I believe me, like I love talking about options. I love calendars. My, my favorite strategies personally, and this is just me, this is not reflect the views of my employer or any, anybody that I represent. It's just my views personally, um, and this is not financial advice. I personally love calendars and I love spreads. I love I love credit spreads. And I so, promise in part two we will explain that. Oh, I mean, before we get to part two, though, should we talk about the Greeks? Because I think they're kind of yeah, before we talk no. about strategies, we need to talk about the things the strategies are in place to yes. look at or hedge against. Absolutely. So that's where we get to yeah. the Greeks. So for those of you that so thought like, math was over, um, no. Well, like, think about, yeah, and like, you know, we <laughs> talked about profiting to the downside, right? Like, if you really thought that the markets are going to crater sometime in the next three to six months, you can buy a put option dated next three to six months with a three to six month expiration, right? But we had to look for, like, as far as which put option to buy, right? If you wanted to buy a put option on the, um, the S&P 500, let's just say the SPX, okay. right? You can pull up the SPX option chain, you can pull up their put option, and you can look at you know, and you can kind of, you know, weigh odds, right? You can say that I think there's a, you know, there's a, there's an eight out of 10 chance that, that it craters by 30%. So you want to look for the option that has a 40% chance of being in the money, because you think if it craters, it's going to, you know, that 40% chance option is going to be actually in the money at some point, right? Yeah. Um, so you want to look for something. That sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so that's. No, you want to look for something that you think is going to be in the money when what you think is going to happen happens. Yeah. So yeah. So um, that essentially is like your max profit potential, right? So the, one of the best ways to judge, you know, the percent chance of an option being in the money, you know, just from a pure statistical standpoint is using the greeks right the, absolutely the, uh, it allows you to it allows you to because each greek yeah they all count for something different so you'd be looking at each one to do a different thing yes right there's four greeks we really worry about maybe five now because <laughs> yeah but that's we're that in an environment one. that we haven't historically i'm yeah, still the fifth one's in an environment we historically haven't seen I'm still, I'm still not sold on the fifth one me personally uh but the first four absolutely i think are, are vitally important so, so we just want to start up with yeah. delta Yes, not Del the airline, but um, <laughs> Delta, I think, is by far and beyond the most important. Yes, but Delta is yeah, like uh, if you look at nothing else, look at the Delta, at least, please. If you're trading options, yeah. please at least look at the Delta. Yeah, because it's, it's going to be pretty critical. Right. So, so Delta is the relationship, right? The rate of change between the options price and a one dollar change in the underlying assets price. Absolutely. So it's it's a price sensitivity measure. It's very similar to, in more general economics, um, an elasticity look or yes, it, it, looking at elasticity. That's exactly what it's like. So think about it this way, right? If you have a one delta option, right? So let's just say Apple stock, right? It's 140, let's just say it's 150 bucks, right? So if you have a one delta option, positive one, that is. Yeah, if positive one. Positive, yeah. If a positive one delta option, if the stock moves from 150 to 151, then the price of your option will also increase by one dollar. Yes, right, because it's that it's a positive correlation between the two. I.e., yeah. what one does, the other does. Exactly. So a 0. 0.5 delta means that for every dollar you see an increase, the option would increase by fifty cents. Exactly. Yeah. Also, one of the things that people, you know, like if you want to really think about it this way, delta. A lot of traders, I, I don't know how they come up with this, but they also think if you see delta, that's also the percent chance that it expires in the money. So if you see a, a 75 delta, a 0.75 delta for a certain option, there is quote unquote 75% chance that it expires in the money. Also, that also, it, it means that if the stock moves up a dollar, 
then the price of the option moves up by 75 cents. If the stock moves down by a dollar, then the price of the option moves down by 75 cents. And there are also negative delta options, right? So puts, puts are generally okay. negative delta. If you buy a deep in the money put, right? So if the stock is trading at 150 and you buy a 100 strike put, odds are you, you probably have a negative one delta option. If the stock moves up by a buck, then the price of the option moves down by a buck and vice exactly. versa. Yeah, stock- so, that's, so that's what we're looking at with Delta, right? So yeah. it's- um, Oh, sure, I got that mixed up actually. I meant the 150 strike put when the stock is at 100. That's what I meant. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, okay, that yeah, no, be, that's, that's, I was, I was gonna, like, hang on. Yeah, my bad, my bad, yeah. Yeah, right. So, so yeah, what you were saying is that about using Delta, uh, the Delta to determine what is the implication that it'll, the pro- the, or the implied probability that it ends in the money. And the reason for that would be is that you would not see such strong Deltas Unless it was already very close to being in the money. If it is yeah, well, already usually, in the like money. the at the money, like usually what happens and depends on like when, how, like how far away from expiration it is. But usually, if you're looking at like, you know, 22 to 36 days to expiration, so about, mm-hmm. just say like about a month, a month to expiration, those options at the money, right? The calls and the puts, the calls are 50 delta, the puts are negative 50 delta, usually. Usually, that's what it is. You know, if you go really deep into the money, like if you go deep into the money on either the call or the put side, you're probably facing either negative one, a negative one delta for puts and a positive one delta for calls, right? The deeper in the money, the more, the the higher the delta is for calls and deeper in the money for puts, the closer to negative one it is. Exactly. So they move, they move towards the one or negative one where they, depending on where they are in likelihood to, so that's just like I said, Delta moves. Delta doesn't stay. No, it doesn't. It it uh, does does not stay the same. It will, it changes constantly throughout the day. And and that's, and that's why I say like, that's not necessarily the worst way to look at it, but it's also because if you're seeing an option that's, it's got a, it's, it's got a Delta of 0.9, it's, you're, you're probably looking at whatever the security is and comparing that to the option going, oh yeah. No, it's 90%. really flirting with shooting past the, the, the price we're dealing with Yeah, well, one, one way or the other. Usually speaking too, like the higher Delta it is, the more you're probably going to have to pay for it, right? So, exactly. Yeah. B- because Which makes like, sense. As it, as it becomes closer to being a more profitable thing, the more someone will want you to, yeah. to charge you for it. Which, think about Which this makes way. sense. Yeah. Think about this way. Like if I'm going to buy the right to buy a stock from you, let's say there's the stock trading at hundred bucks. So the stock is already at hundred bucks. If I want to buy, if I want the right to buy the stock at ninety five bucks from James, like you're gonna at least charge me five bucks because it's already got an intrinsic value of five bucks. Yeah, it's already right? that value is already there. So the le- it's it's the best alternative for me is to turn around and just buy at the market at a hundred and sell to you. Yeah, for that, an, yes, right. So. so normally, like you know, like that's kind of like the delta risk, right? When there's a 0.9 delta, it's like odds are you're probably gonna have to pay a ton of money for that for that option. But there's also other things well, too, like, absolutely. like gamma risk, right? So Delta, like you said, changes all the time. And why does it change all the time? Because the stock price changes all the time throughout the day too. So it's changing with every trade, with every buy and exactly. sell. Yeah. Um, so if, yeah, so if I was sitting on a 50 Delta option, right? 50 Delta call option and, and the stock went from, you know, $50 to $51, what do you think is going to happen to the Delta of the call option that I'm sitting on. Well, the Delta is going to go up. Yeah. And because of yeah, that, exactly. that's going to change the gamma. Exactly. So that's the gamma. That's the, essentially that's what gamma is. All right. That's the second Greek, right? So gamma just basically means the change in the Delta per the change in the underlying stock price, which is kind of like a yeah. windy twist. It allows, us to, it allows us to make, to use another decimal number essentially to determine how much, um, how much the option yeah. itself is changing in value. So the delta yeah. is what is the options price doing during based on a one dollar change in the securities price, whereas gamma is indicates the amount delta will change given that one do- that same one dollar movement, right? So it's yeah. it's it's a slightly different. It's a second order derivative, exactly. Um, so a derivative of the derivative. Yeah. So it's a much um, more confusing. It's weird because it's a much more confusing. It's probably I would say the most confusing Greek, but it really it's a, and it's also really sensitive, and that's the reason why it's probably so confusing is because it's like if you have a f- if 0.04 delta, that's a pretty high delta. That's like, holy cow. Yeah, like, the numbers generally stay very small, especially when you're far away from expiration, right? So it's, yeah, um, it, it, it's far away from expiration and also far out of the money or far from at the money, right? Because if you're in the money, there's, there's not that much gamma risk. It's not going to move. Your delta's not going to move very much if you're so deep into the money. But if you're right at the money, you're going to have like a 0.04 delta, which is really, like, if you think about it, that's really sensitive. Like the underlying stock price really pushes the actual price of the option pretty easily. Yeah, and so that's, and that's when we start to see 
And we should see that reflected in the gamma. Exactly. As it, as it increases, that, so you're seeing, okay, we're getting closer to expiration. We're getting closer to being in the money. So, you know, your gamma is going to kind of shoot up. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I should say this too. So like, if you're looking for, you know, if I buy a 30 Delta option from James, so the Delta is 0.3, James is technically like his exposure to the stock is negative three Delta. And my exposure to the stock is positive 0.3 delta, right? So yeah. that's so you got to think about it that way too, right? And then of course, as the delta changes, like that becomes our exposure, right? So if the stock price goes up and the delta becomes 0.4, I am now you know four deltas long exposure wise to the underlying security in James's negative four delta, you know, in terms of exposure to the uh, underlying security. Kind of confusing, but. You know, if you have more questions about it, we'd be more than happy to break it down. Um, I guess real quick, we should probably touch on the last yeah, couple of so the days. last two, uh, so there's theta, which is just uh, is a representation of how time, time affects the price of the option, right? So yes. that's also called time decay. Yeah, time uh, decay is huge with options because think about it this way, right? So if I buy an option from James and it expires this Friday, right? There's not that much time for the stock to go into the money of the option, right? So if I buy no, a fifty dollars, especially if it's well out, yeah. If I buy a fifty dollars, so if I buy a fifty dollars strike call and the stock is at forty five bucks and it expires on Friday, I mean the stock has to move more than ten percent to the upside for me to actually have exposure. So James like would be more than happy to sell it to me, but he probably wouldn't get very much money out of it because there's not that much theta risk, right? But if I buy a fifty strike call when the stock is at forty five bucks that expires in july of next year james is probably going to want a lot more money yeah for that time because it's got more time to shoot up and above it's got more 50. time to get there exactly so yeah it's it's yeah. it's you know it's it's the like i said the closer you get to um expiration the less, then yeah. you wouldn't have as much i wouldn't have as much theta risk if i was selling so i would be able yeah. to go for a lower price just going what are the you know if say it, it expired this friday and not two weeks from now i'd be like what are the chances that the price is really going to get wherever we're talking about in f- right. in four days? And also, the way you have to look at theta is like so. For every day that passes, all else held constant. What's that word again? Uh, ceteris paribus. Ceteris paribus. Gosh, I I need to remember that because they talk about it in the CFA. But ceteris paribus. For every day that goes on, the price of the option will decrease by this much. By the theta, right? yeah. So if yeah. you have a theta of minus 0.5, for every day you move forward, the option loses 50 cents of value. Exactly. That's, that's, that's exactly how it's measured. So like if you're trying to short an option, right? A lot of people that are trying to short uh, calls or short puts, you know, they usually look at, they usually try to get some theta out of it, right? A theta and uh, the next thing that we're going to look at, which is vega, usually is where the bulk of extrinsic value for an option comes from. Every option has extrinsic or intrinsic value. It really just means how much it's in the money. Intrinsic value is just how much it's in the money. So if it's not in the money, it's got zero intrinsic value. Extrinsic value is essentially just time decay and volatility. Like why is a $5 in the money option being sold for $8 or being traded for $8? It's because of that. Through your extra dollars that you're paying is time decay and also imply volatility. So, you know, I guess that really segues into um, which takes us, Vega. Which takes us to Rho. Well, 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 I guess, no. Vega. Which takes us into Vega, you're right. Um, yeah. Which Vega is the rate of change to so the relationship between the options value and its and the and the underlying asset, right? So the asset that yeah. we're taking this derivative of implied volatility. Really, just as I think about it, it is just um, it's just implied volatility, right? So like if you look at GameStop, this is just implied volatility. Yeah, if you look at GameStop, yeah. right? You know, so like last year, I, I'll be honest with you, I joined I joined the GameStop trade and I actually made a little bit of money off of it. I only did one trade, and what I did was I bought a put option. I bought the right to sell GameStop at twenty bucks a share when the stock was at eighty. And the stock only went from 80 to 150, right? So if I have the right to sell a $150 stock for 20 bucks, who in their right mind would actually exercise that, right? No one. But I bought the put option for a dollar. And because from the time it went from $80 to 150, the implied volatility shot through the roof. I was able to sell my put option for more than a dollar because of Vega. The yeah. implied volatility went from like 252% to like 400%. And that made the price of my put shoot up even though it was well out of the money and had no intrinsic value whatsoever but the implied volatility of gamestop was so high 
that it was yeah. like, well, the markets, it may be back down. At yeah, 20 the markets were thinking exactly. The markets were thinking this stock might shoot from one fifty all the way back down to fifteen dollars in a day, right? It might it might shave ninety percent of its value in one it day. Could. It was up by two. It was up to two fifty. Exactly. Day. So um, I, I don't think it was right, unfair, so, I don't think it was an unfair trade. I think uh, you know I think what I did was just taking advantage of implied volatility. I, th- I felt like vol- implied volatility was going to shoot up, and I made that trade right. So that's essentially what it is, right? That's essentially what Vega is. Yeah. So so Vega is generally highest when you're yeah exactly and, at the money, and um, if you're at the money and you have a very long time until expiration. Yeah, right? that's, and that's, that's essentially that the same it, with like with theta too. So if theta is like you know obviously 300 days out, theta is going to be super high. But theta has a very, very slow decline. So like if you have you know an option that expires a year from now, theta has a very, very slow decline. And then at around 43 days, they're saying 43 days to expiration is usually when theta accelerates. Yeah, it's when it right? wakes That's, up and actually becomes a meaningful amount because up until then, you don't have any idea, yeah, you know, barring exactly. any extreme economic condition with the underlying security, your theta isn't going to isn't gonna know where to do, what to do yeah, because until, the are, until you're close enough to, that there's no other option expiring prior to it, yeah really. exactly because like you know 300 um, days from now yeah it can the stock can go up but it also has a pretty good likelihood of going down too but you know like you know in a secular bull market i i think you know there's still more risk to the upside so there's still a well a good amount of theta of price in every single day but theta decay is like one cent when it's 300 days away but it can be 50 cents a day when it's a week yeah it, you know, well, five days usually out. one week it's like 80 cents yeah like you know a lot like yeah so I, it's so that's I remember when i was trading in video calls i was like you know it was like i would see like you know a five dollar at the money option and I look at theta decay and it's freaking you know it's five dollar at the money option right so which means Ooh. it's it's not in the money right and at the time it was a 200 dollars stock so like a 2% move to the upside, it, you, you know, you're $4 into the money. So honestly, like $5 at the money call, not unreasonable, uh, but it also had a theta decay of like 80 cents, you know, or like, you know, some I've seen theta decays of, you know, $20 for like, you know, Tesla call options. So, I, I mean, I'm telling you, yeah. it's not like th- theta, theta is a real beast. And it's something that you definitely have to pay attention to, especially for shorting options if you're and taking a credit spread. Which we'll talk about next presentation, I promise. But yeah. with Vega, we also see there's also a really funny not necessarily funny, but just the way it works is that um, as as volatile as as implied volatility of the uh, of the asset increases, Vega increases. As that volatility decreases, Vega decreases. So it's you can kind of see where people are thinking, or where rather the calculations are saying, and what they're saying about a about a security when you see it's Vega increasing or decreasing is when you see is when you can say, oh, it's starting to smooth out, or it's starting to get really really rocky. Yeah, um, yeah. So like whenever you see a peak in Vega and or theta mm-hmm. maybe, maybe a good time to short short an option that way you could take advantage it's when, it's when you're starting to see really wild swings right yeah well like and honestly like you know if you see a negative 80 theta option right obviously the stock has to stay the same everything else you know has to stay the same everything else still needs to be constant but if you short a negative 80 theta option and everything else does remain constant and you wait till the next day you can buy it back for 80 cents cheaper that, that's the theory of theta so normally speaking, like that's kind of like how you look for opportunities to short is like, is there a lot of theta decay? Because if there is, maybe there's, maybe there's, a, there's an opportunity there. And also, is there a lot of implied volatility? If there is, maybe there's an opportunity there as well. Yeah. Well, this brings so, us to the f- kind of the fifth and final of the yes. Greeks, which is one that I was, I was, I was trying to jump to earlier because I wasn't really thinking about things, but um, it's one that, that no one, no options trader really yeah, I don't even think seen about it. A situation in, in fourteen. Well, they, they'll have seen it in the last two years. I don't even but know. For the thirteen like, years preceding I, that, they would never have been in a situation where this was something that would needed to be calculated. And it's called Rho, yeah, which is which is spelled uh, R H O. The rate of change, yeah. yeah, which is the change between an options value and a one percent change in the interest rate. Which, um, and the reason <laughs> that no one's seen this for the last decade. It's because interest rates weren't going pretty much, up. Yeah, well, I mean, it was pretty much free interest. Or moving at all. And not, not to mention, like, you know, like how often, like normally speaking, how often do interest rates change anyways, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's still not a very frequent thing. You know, it's not like, it's not like theta decay where it changes every single day or delta where it changes every single tick of the, tr- every single or, trade Or tick, Vega, which is, right? or with Vega, which would also change with all the, would change with major um, volume buys or sells of a stock. Right. So or like, a security. I, yeah. I mean, like um, in two years on the trade desk, I never talked about row one time. Like I, no one's ever talked about row. I've asked senior traders uh, at TD Ameritrade. No one's ever talked about row. So like I'm, 
to be honest with you, like I don't necessarily know how important Rho is, but essentially that's what it is. It's the right the way it affects. So, so Rho, if you had a Rho, that so it's it's what is the rate of change at a one percent increase in interest rate? So, say there's a Fed meeting coming up, and you're sitting on options, week, yeah. and you're looking at an option that's got a row of I don't know point three point one a okay, point yeah. one. That's probably right? more realistic. And your options trading at a buck fifty. Well, if the Fed comes out and were to raise interest rates by one percent, you then, get a ten cent yeah. increase in the value option. So it would go from one fifty to one sixty. So that might not, if you're holding the option, it might be a decent time to, to sell on that liquidate. increase. If, yeah. you're, if you're looking to, it's also all else hold constant too, because like if interest rates did go up by a one percent, odds are the stock would crater, and you know, and and at that point, the delta would go from 0. 0.5 or whatever it is to 0. 0.3. Which would make the option much less. Well, yeah. So, so, so well, I'm saying if we're doing that with Rome, we're assuming everything else. We might say, okay, yeah. maybe I would get in there with my uh, and I'd put us. I'd put an order in that says, okay, I have my row of point one. Yeah. I expect seventy five basis points. So I know I'll get seven seven and a half cents increase in the value of my option. And so I sit that the second they announce the interest rate, the second the interest rate actually hits markets and increases by that amount, and before it hits the my stock, option, the I sell moves, my options. Yes. Before anyone else can, yes. But well, literally, I mean, everyone else has a better computer. Yeah. Well, I mean, literally, and that's that's actually pretty funny. But like, literally, the thing about all of these Greeks is that it's literally all else held constant. So yeah. the stock price does. Yeah. Now, that's so, not how that works. Yes. But this is how they <laughs> interact. Now they also interact with each other because some are obviously, if you're a derivative of the derivative, you are obviously affected by by what you're a derivative from. Right, yeah. Well, um, I mean, obviously, like, if you have higher delta, like, then you also probably have higher theta, too, depending on how close you are to expiration. Right, so it's, th- it's things like that, right? And obviously, you know, how close you are to being in the money, like, you know, usually the, the Greeks matter the most for the at-the-money options. So if it's at-the-money, implied volatility probably matters a little bit more. If you're so far out of the money, like, if, you know, if I'm trying to buy a $150 strike call for a stock that's trading at 50 bucks, there's not going to be that much implied volatility and theta decay because they're just because who would want to exercise at 150 when the stock is trading 50 bucks, right? So it's usually always at at the money near the money stuff, like yeah. where the Greeks really matter more in the money at well in the so, money at the money or um yeah as we but if, ab- yeah but if you're so like like I said if you're so far in the money like you know there's, there's really not much theta decay because you're if you have a one delta there's no there's no extrinsic value you have a one delta. You're, you're essentially just buying the stock. Exactly. At that point, you're buying the stock for either a deal or a song and a dance, right? Yeah. Like, if you think about it like that. Like, you're, just, you're essentially just buying the stock, right? And if you're negative one delta, you're essentially just shorting the stock. Yeah. It's someone essentially right? offering you the ability um, to bet on a horse race that's already finished. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, obviously, like, there's a lot more that goes into it. And like, like I said, like, we yeah. promise next week we'll have, we'll have more on... Bull put spreads, bear put spreads, iron condors, diagonals, or calendars. Yes, um, which I Aaron love loves. Yeah, we'll have. We'll um, talk about butterflies, we'll have but, straddles, and yeah, straddles and strangles, which I think are, are very important too. Like, which I think can be good hedging strategies. But like, we'll talk about butterflies. I don't like. I don't. I'm not a huge on butterflies. I don't love butterflies. Yeah, I, don't really, I mean, we'll talk about them theoretically. What they're and what they're like. What you're trying to how do they are, with a butterfly? How they are yeah. constructed and what you're trying to do. Not necessarily anything beyond that. Because remember, this is not financial advice, and it doesn't reflect either of our employers or yes or exactly any, any, any clients yeah um but with that said i mean uh i'm all out of whiskey so i don't know what else to do but to you know put on my nice little drunkenomics hoodie and uh read a good book where did you get that hoodie my guy uh drunkenomics.myspreadshop.com is where i got it that is it's, awesome. it's free to that i mean literally great. anybody can get a hoodie there it's pretty awesome and it's perfect for this time of year it is kind of like it irish is. whiskey you can also get some pretty uh some some sweet other merch there as well um exactly. not necessarily a golf shirt but i mean a top golf shirt it's, <laughs> there it's, it's cold in some places <laughs> i.e um, where you live <laughs> but if you but if you don't want to buy the actual security and you just want to buy an option with us go ahead and check out patreon.com yeah slash economics. <laughs> if you want to buy some cover and, calls uh, from us that might expire worthless uh yeah you put a tip in the tip jar at patreon.com slash drunkenomics that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot c-o-m slash drunkenomics d-r-u-n-k-e-n-o-m-i-c-s absolutely that's where you can help yeah, us you can help us at uh, this point keep the whiskey from freezing um <laughs> keep the whiskey totally stones do, man. chilled yeah, keep now keep the tel- keep the Tully Dew liquid instead of frozen. It's getting chilly out. <laughs> it is, but yeah, you can help us keep the uh, the ice cold and the uh, uh, wow the ice the ice frozen 
beer cold and the uh, the fruit fresh with yeah. that nice zest. Exactly. But, but last but not least, uh, seriously, I really appreciate it. I hope this uh, I hope this episode, this presentation, wasn't too confusing. If you have any questions, seriously, I love talking to options. We will like, we I will do everything we can to clarify. Yes, I will be more days. than happy to talk about options in the group chat. Uh, which is our Discord, which can be found through um, any of our social media sites, and any of course, of our social media. Yeah, and of course, if you want to hit me up on LinkedIn, I mean, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn and drop in a question about, you know, how do you do? What, what is a credit spread on options? I'd be more than happy to answer those questions too. I love talking to options. Yeah, feel free to track uh, either of us down on any of our social media, so any of that stuff at LinkedIn. Yeah, uh, follow Drunkenomics on LinkedIn. I know we've got one there. Yeah. Um, but with that said, seriously, I mean, watch out for watch out for the PPI report. Um, oh yeah, that's coming out. Tomorrow. Yeah, it's coming this week. Next week, CPI uh, and Fed announcement. We'll see what happens. Last one of the year. Fed announcement, so. yeah, last one of the year. But uh. yeah, with that said, seriously, please play chess on checkers. I know there's a lot of volatility. Chess players are going to make it through. Checkers players, I don't know. I don't know what their fate is going to be, but please be it'll one of those be, chess players. It'll be pure luck. <laughs> yeah. Um. But from there, also, uh, don't brag, just say, always fill and kill unless you're about to drive somewhere. In which case, wait till you get there. Yeah. Um, but most importantly, please do that one thing. Uh, what's that thing called again? Um, uh, it's got. You got to stay drunk at Amigo, guys. That's what it is. Cheers, my friend. Cheers.